John 11, 38 through 44. The King James text today reads, Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou heardest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Hallelujah. The question I pose this afternoon is this. Who do I talk to? If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we humble ourselves in your presence, desiring more than anything in this life that you would anoint today your representative who would stand in the sacred desk with a word from heaven to deliver to the people of God. Lord, humanity is fickle and we are strange and funny. Oh God, oftentimes the word of God comes forth and there is something in our spirit, there is something going on in our life, there is something happening in our mind that causes us to rebel against that which we hear, to reject that which the Spirit is trying to speak to our spirit. But the Word of God declares the anointing of God is like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And we ask God today that your powerful, wonderful Holy Ghost anointing would rest upon your messenger. Lord, that any obstacle, anything that would try to stand in the way, anything that would try to hinder the Word of God from reaching its mark and executing the change that is necessary, for the child of God to not just hear, but receive and benefit by the word of God. Lord, today let the anointing flow like a mighty river today. Wash away our sin, wash away our weakness, wash away our fault. Change us, challenge us, cause us today to rise to higher heights and to know in you this hour deeper depths than we've ever before known. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I don't know how it works in every state in the union. I don't know if things are the same or if they're different. But I know here in Texas, if you are experiencing certain difficulties uh, in your life, there is a number that you can call on your phone to get information about who you can call. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I believe it's 211, isn't it? It's not 411. 
411 is what you used to call to get a telephone number. Uh, I'm not even sure that even works anymore. But 211 is the number here in Texas. You dial that number and you tell the person on the other end, who do I call? And then you explain about this. I have children and I've lost my job and I don't have any income and I need to feed my family. Who do I call? Or I'm in a situation right now where my landlord is trying to evict me and I don't know what to do. Who do I call? I'm going through an immigration situation right now and I'm uncertain as to what I need to do. Who do I call? Amen. Because you got to call the right people if you're going to get the right information. If you're going to get the right result you've got to call the right person mm -hmm. oftentimes as people of God we need help and we must call someone for information about who it is exactly that we should speak to in order to attain the help we need you don't call, for instance, the Social Security Administration about drug rehabilitation. Nor do you call your local fire department when you have a leak or a plumbing issue. The key to getting things done and getting it done right is knowing who to talk to in any given situation. Right. So it is as well today with the kingdom of God. Many people pray and ask the Lord to do things which he has already given them, listen to me children, the means to address. Nothing happens. And they accuse God of not hearing and not answering their prayer. Well... You don't call home when you're a student in school in 6th grade or 7th grade. You don't call home to ask your mother or your dad for permission to go to the restroom, do you? No, you ask your teacher. My goodness, sometimes we're talking to the wrong person. Sometimes we're not speaking correctly. We're not speaking to the right individual. And today the Lord has instructed me by the Holy Ghost to help you as a child of God understand who it is you need to call. Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus in our primary text today. And you know, people, you know, they don't think about the fact. I love these people who want to deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. I love these cults and uh, folks that don't want to acknowledge the divinity of Jesus Christ. Every miracle Jesus performed, every single one of them, was evidence of his divinity. Right. It was not evidence of him having some sort of unique relationship with God or having some special place in God's heart. That's not what was happening. Because you don't see Jesus laying hands on people and praying for them. You don't see the Lord laying hands on people and then asking God, quote unquote, to heal them, do you? No. He would lay hands on them and he would speak either to the person or he would speak to the sickness or the disease or he would speak to the spirit of infirmity that was causing the sickness or disease. And the disease would run. It would run scared. The demon that was afflicting that individual would run scared because he was operating within his authority as God manifests in human form. That's why when he was out in the midst of the sea and the storm was raging and the ship was being tossed to and fro, he was able to sleep because he knew that when a storm ever made that could overtake him. If he was headed to the other side of the sea, he was going to get there. Right. Amen. Well, the disciples didn't understand. 
quite as well as he did. But you see, that's the problem with a lot of Christians today. We don't understand as well as the Lord. There are times we ought to be sleeping through the storm, and instead we're running like a bunch of scared rats. We're running around terrified, screaming and yelling at God. God, don't you understand we're about to die? And the Lord looks at us and says, I don't think so. Last words I remember speaking to you were, let's go to the other side. Hello now. See, God ain't going to tell you, hallelujah, God ain't going to tell you, let's go to the other side and then let you drown in the middle of the sea. Hmm. My sure. Lord, have mercy. Tell you a lot of people, you got a good reason to be afraid you're going to drown. I'll tell you why. Because you're operating in your own will. You're operating in your own way. You're doing things the way you want to do it. You're going where you want to go. You're doing what you want to do. You're not listening to God. God has spoken, and like old Noah, excuse me, Jonah, you decided to go another way. My Lord, have mercy. Okay. Isn't it funny? In both situations, a storm arose. But in one situation, they had nothing to fear. In the other situation, it was Jonah who knew, I'm to blame for the mess I'm in. I'll tell you, a lot of Christians that do well to recognize they're to blame for the mess they're in. That's true. Come on. My Lord, have mercy they listen to God and they follow the leading of the Holy Ghost that they let the Lord tell them what he wanted them to do and where he wanted them to go. Oh, but I don't want to go that route because I don't get enough glory. I don't want to go that route because people aren't going to think I'm a celebrity. I don't want to go that route because I'm not going to make enough money. I don't want to go that route because it's not going to do for me what I want done. But honey, if God said, let's go to the other side, you're assured that you're going to get to the other side. If God hadn't spoken and you're acting on your own volition and you're doing your own way and your own thing, then guess what? You're on your own. Hmm. In the Old Testament, the Lord said, I'm with you so long as you're with me. He said, but the minute you leave me, you're on your own. That's what he told the nation of Israel. Got news for you today, folks. God ain't going to chase you. He will lead you. He will guide you. But the minute you stop following, you're on your own. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. People wonder why Tommy and I are in this situation now where we don't know about his job situation after November. We know one job's ended. We don't know uh, about a new job coming up. Let me pick this up a minute. Excuse me. We don't know what's going to happen. We're waiting for the Lord to open some doors. We don't know what direction this ministry is going to go in. Whether we're going to have to pick up and restart in a whole different city somewhere. In a whole different town. We may not even be in a city. We may wind up out in the boondocks somewhere. Uh, whatever, wherever we wind up, so long as God is leading, honey, I'm happy to go. I learned a long time ago that only an idiot argues with the Holy Ghost. You've got to be pretty stupid to try to outwit God. You can't be very bright if you think you know better what it is you ought to do and where it is you ought to go and how it is you ought to go about doing what you need to do. When the Holy Ghost spoke to me at the age of 16 years old to come to Texas and all I had in Texas was a great aunt that I did not know very well at all. And her, her one of her daughters still lived at home. She was about five years older than me. The other daughter was married and her eldest son was married and they had families and, you know, I wasn't very close to them. I didn't know them very well. I knew the daughter that still lived at home a little bit. Was I scared when God spoke to me and said, I want you to go to Texas? Was I nervous? Was I trepidatious? Oh, yes, of course I was. 
Anytime you go somewhere and you don't know before you start what's going to be there when you get there, of course you're going to be a little nervous. That's just human nature. But I'll tell you what, I don't know where I came up with this stubbornness. I don't know where I come up. Some people might call it faith. I don't know where I came up with this faith. But somewhere in my spirit I knew that if God was telling me to go to Texas, that the smartest, best thing I'd ever do in my life was go to Texas. I came to Texas February 12th, 1982. Never forget it, so long as I live. Rode an airplane for the first time. I was terrified, petrified, hated heights. If I even rode, tried to ride on a roller coaster, I was so scared I couldn't see straight. And here I was on an airplane because God spoke to me to go to Texas. I knew if God spoke to me to go to Texas, He's not going to let me die in a plane crash trying to get there. You hear what I'm telling you now? I knew enough to obey the voice of God. So I'll tell you what I did. Got on a plane, came to Texas. Long story short, I became part of a church in Texas. It was a different denomination that I had grown up in. It did things differently than, uh, it was still a Pentecostal church, but it was different in many ways than the church I grew up in. I wound up under a pastor that I adored and admired and appreciated, a man of God with great wisdom who taught me the ins and outs of the power of God and letting the Holy Ghost have his way and letting God be God in the church and I'm going to tell you I learned so many things from Brother Gillum to this day it's been 35, 40 years since then and I'm still still preaching and teaching and living and believing and worshiping the way that Brother Gillum taught me to do these things. He wound up being the singular, most powerful, and important influence on my life and my Christian testimony and on my ministry of any pastor I've ever had. I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't take, you couldn't pay me enough money to go back in time and do things differently than I did. Oh, so brother, you came to Texas and everything went perfect. Everything went smooth. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> no, it did not. <laughs> not at all. I experienced a lot of good and I experienced some tough things too. But you know what? All the, of the things I experienced taught me something. Everything I experienced helped me in my walk with God, helped me to prepare for my life in ministry, helped me to prepare for what God had uh, in my future. The Lord told me when he called me to Texas, he said, I'm going to prepare you for your ministry. You cannot preach faith without knowing how to live by faith. Well, you can't know how to live by faith if you don't go through some struggles and some troubles and some hardships. But I'm going to tell you, my overall experience was glorious. I mean, to tell you, it, it was a marvelous experience. I wouldn't take anything for it. And it helped me to be who I am today. I want to tell you something. If there's anything God's people need to learn, they need to learn who to talk to. The disciples on the boat running around like a bunch of scared chickens. They run to Jesus and they wake the Lord up. Lord, don't you care that we perish? Got news for you, folks. They were talking to the wrong person. They were talking to the wrong thing. They, they didn't need to talk to the Lord at all. See, the Lord turned around, got up, went to the front of the boat, and He did what they should have done to begin with. Listen to me now. He rebuked the wind and the waves, and He told the sea to calm itself down, and it did. Well, Peter, James, and John could have done the same thing. The only problem is they didn't know who the 
right source to talk to was. Instead of talking to their trouble, instead of talking to their problem, they ran to their God. But I got news for you. God had already equipped them. He had already given them authority. He had already given them power, the Word of God said. He had already told them nothing shall by any means harm you. He had already equipped them to deal with a situation like this. I'm going to tell you, a lot of Christians mess up because when certain circumstances and situations arise, they go running to the Lord. You say, well, brother, you can never go wrong running to Jesus. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. If God's already equipped you and God's already told you how to handle the situation and what you need to do and who you need to talk to, then honey, running to Him is not going to help you. God ain't looking for a bunch of sissies. He ain't looking for a bunch of spiritual chickens. He's not looking for a bunch of spiritual wimps. He's looking for soldiers who are full of the Holy Ghost, who understand that he said in Acts chapter 1, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He's looking for people who are going to walk in the power and in the authority that he has given them as born again, Holy Ghost baptized, tongue talking, fire filled people of God. I used to have a, my grandfather, bless his heart. I think he was vexed by devils. I really do. Uh, not possessed, but I think he was vexed by certain spirits. And my grandfather could get into a mood. Whew, I mean, he'd get into a mood. And he'd just be cussing and carrying on all day and all night. And I mean, some of these moods could last for days. And he'd just be in a miserable, negative crabby, grumpy, and, and every time he'd get into one of these moods, he'd cuss like a sailor spirit. I mean, he cussed like, he invented cuss words. And I told my grandmother one time, I said, you know, Grandma, there are times when Grandpa goes off on a tangent like that. I said, I'm here to tell you, it's a devil. There's a demon vexing him. There's a demon troubling him. I said, instead of saying, oh, Lord Jesus, help us. Oh, Lord Jesus, please do something for Don, Lord. Help Don. I said, what you need to do, let me tell you who you need to talk to. You need to talk to that demon. I said, don't talk to Grandpa. Talk to the demon. I said, you need to look at him and say, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. Shut your mouth and stop vexing my husband. And my grandmother, the Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal woman that she was, full of power and full of faith, looked at me and said, oh, dear God, I could never do that. I said, well, you just keep sitting there whispering a prayer to the Lord in the corner like a coward. I said, you just keep doing that. I said, I guarantee you, nothing's going to change. Nothing is going to happen. Because God has given you the power. God has given you the authority to take command of that situation. I said, now let me tell you, so you do it enough. I said, Grandpa's going to be grateful to you for it. Because he's being vexed. There's something that is frustrating and irritating and causing him to become like this. Oh no! Because after all, Christians are full of fear and full of terror. God forbid we do what the Word of God tells us to do. Finally, one day, some years later, Jason and I, my former partner, my grandmother invited us to go with my grandfather and she and my uncle's two daughters from Connecticut down to Pennsylvania where my uncle was now living with his new wife. And grandma said, we're bringing Philip's daughters down to him for Thanksgiving. 
He's invited us to come down and, and we're going to bring the girls and we're going to spend Thanksgiving with him. And he said to invite you and Jason as well. And so I thought, oh, well, that'd be fun. I'd like to do that. That'd be good. So we all piled into my grandparents' van, and we're driving down to Pennsylvania, and boy, my grandfather is just in one of his moods. I mean, he's in one of his moods. And oh, dear God, he's cussing everybody and everything. I mean to tell you, he is just, whew, turning the air blue, green, purple, yellow, orange, you name it. We were seeing it. Finally, I'm sitting behind him, but I'm sitting across from him like this. Finally, I looked at him and I said, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. You shut your foul mouth. You are not going to influence this trip. You are not going to destroy this vacation for us. I said, no, sir, we're not going to have that. I'll never forget as long as I live. My mother probably going to giggle when I say this. My grandfather looked over at Dorothy, uh, Dorothy, at my grandmother. My grandfather looked over at my grandmother. And he looked at her and he said, is he talking to me? Grandma said, I think he's talking to the devil, Don. My grandfather never said one word about what I just said. Never said one word about it. And let me tell you, I kid you not, the rest of that trip was heaven. His whole spirit changed. His whole personality changed. See, she could have done that for him on any number of occasions. She could have helped him to overcome what was overcoming him. But instead of walking in the power of God, she walked in fear. And she kept going to the wrong source. Who do I talk to? Oh, I'll go to Jesus about it. Honey, go to Jesus till you turn blue. God has given you the tools whereby to deal with this. When it comes to issues of spiritual warfare, you don't talk to the Lord, you talk to the devil. You don't talk to God, you talk to the demon that's causing you trouble. Many of God's children run to daddy and complain that a bully is attacking them. They ask him to do something about it. And daddy sits in his chair and does nothing. Well, then they wonder why nothing changes and why they're forever tormented by this same bully. I'll tell you why. Because demons are aware of something that many believers are not. God has given his people and his church power and authority over them. Do you hear me now? God has given his people and his church power over the demons and they know it. We have become members of a royal family and the king expects his children to behave as members of the royal family. When demons encroach upon our path, we need to address the demon, not the Lord. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all, all, all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Well, if the Lord gave you that power, you don't need to run to the Lord when the enemy starts trying to vex you, do you? Verse uh, 1, chapter 9 of Luke, the Word of God said, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. 
Mark 16, 17 and 18, Jesus said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. We oftentimes fail to recognize when a spirit is at work. And we then fail to address the spirit. But when a spirit of accusation tries to work through someone, we ought to rebuke the spirit of accusation, not the person through whom that spirit is operating. As an example of what I'm talking about. Years ago, I was operating a resale shop. We used to take stuff in on uh, consignment, you know, and resell it. And we took a portion of the proceeds and gave the rest to the person whose, whose item it was. In our agreement, after the item was in our possession at the store for so long, we marked it down a certain percentage. After it was there another length of time, we marked it down another percentage. After it was there a certain amount of time, we marked it down another percentage. If it didn't sell within a certain amount of time, then the person who was trying to sell it through us would have to come and get it. And if they didn't get it within a certain amount of time, they forfeited it and it became our property. That was all in a contract. Well, we rented a storefront in East Texas from this fella. And his grandson brought me in a, a, a water bed that he wanted to sell. And we put in the store and it sat there for a while. And it sat there and he called me, has his soul? I said, no, I'm sorry, it's your head. Has his soul? No, I'm sorry, it's your head. Well, according to our contract, you know, as time went by, we marked it down a little bit, we marked it down a little bit. Finally, we got it marked down once or twice, and somebody came in and bought it. I called the young man. I said, come get your money. We finally sold your bid. He came in. I gave him his share. He said, how come it's only this much? I said, because it was here for more than 30 or 60 days, whatever it was. I think our, our agreement was based on a 30-day uh, period of time. So after 30 days, we marked it down. After 60 days, we marked it down. After 90 days, we marked it down. At 120 days, you had to pick it up or forfeit it. Okay, so anyway, so, you know, I told him, I said, you understood the contract, you understood the terms, that this is how we sell things, because we can't just have things on the floor taking up all kind of space for months and months and months on end. Well, he went to his dad, who was our landlord, and he complained, or not his dad, his granddad. He went to his granddad, who was our landlord, and complained to him that, well, I only got this much for my water bed. I was trying to get it this much. And his grandfather called me up on the phone. Here he is, the landlord of our storefront that we're using. His grandfather calls me up, and he's talking to me about how it wasn't fair that his grandson only got this. I said, sir, we have a contract. We have it. This business operates on a very specific way of doing things. I said, your grandson signed a contract. He understood that after so many days, we have to mark it down so much, and again so much, and again so much. You know, I said, he understood exactly what the terms were. He got exactly what he was contractually obligated to get. I said, nobody did him dirty. Nobody treated him wrong. And this man had the nerve. Well, if you were any kind of a Christian, you would, and he couldn't even finish that statement, because immediately I knew, oh, no, 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 honey, my Bible said there's one accuser of the brethren. There's only one person, only one entity that accuses God's people, and that is Satan. So if you hear somebody accusing you, coming against your testimony, coming against your walk with God, uh, you hear somebody talking that foolishness, you can know that they're under the influence of the enemy. 
I don't care if they go to church. I don't care if they call themselves a spirit-filled child of God. It don't matter. The minute they try to come against your walk with God and your relationship with like, see, they have no business being there. God don't play games. They have no business being there. The Word of God said, Who are you to speak to another man's servant? Who are you to tell another man's maid or another man's chauffeur how he ought to do his job? It's not your job. No, if they're serving God, whether they're serving God right or wrong, you let, you let God take care of it because he's the one who's in charge. How many Christians do they run around constantly? You can't be a Christian because. You can't be a Christian because. Honey, when you hear that garbage, they are operating under the influence of the enemy. Yes. Because Satan is trying to discourage and dissuade you from serving God and living for the Lord using these arguments, these accusations. Before that man could finish his statement, I literally said, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. Don't you dare try to come against my testimony. Click. <laughs> the phone hung up. I'll never forget it. When an hour later, I got a telephone call. And it was this man, our landlord. He said, Reverend, I am so sorry. I apologize. He said, you're right, I'm wrong. He said, my grandson agreed to those terms. That was the contract. He said, I should have never tried to come against your testimony. He said, I apologize for that. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You try doing things God's way and see if it don't work. See, God don't talk just to hear his own voice. When it comes to matters of spiritual warfare, we are not to run to God and pray and ask God to do something about the devil that's causing us trouble. We're to speak to the devil. Hallelujah. When the Lord allows us to recognize or to discern, there is a spirit at work. We do not go to him and ask him to deal with that spirit, but rather he expects us to walk in our God-given authority and power as children of God, and he expects us to deal with it ourselves, addressing it directly. My Lord had mercy. Who do I talk to? Well, when it comes to demons, you talk to the demons. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the devil, you talk to the devil. I've been in churches where I've literally watched people try to pray demons out of somebody. And I sat there, one church I was in, I sat there for about 40 minutes or better watching a whole church, Jesus name, Pentecostal church, United Pentecostal church, sat there for all that time watching these people try to pray the demons out of a woman who was, the demon was speaking through her in his own voice. I mean, it was as obvious as anything. She had devils and they're praying over her. Oh, they're praying over her. They're praying. And the pastor kept trying to get me to come over and help them. And I said, no, the Holy Ghost didn't tell me it was my time yet. I'm going to tell you something. Only a fool acts before he hears from God. Paul didn't cast the demons out of that woman. They had a spirit of witchcraft on the first outing. He didn't do it on the first day. The Word of God said after several days, Paul finally turned to her and he rebuked the spirit of my telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, God, there's a reason why things have to be done on God's timetable. So finally, after about 40, 45 minutes of them praying, nothing. The Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, now get up, get over there. I said, Lord, that evangelist is right where I need to be. He's right in my way. If you'll move him, I'll be over there in a split second. Literally, Tommy, all of a sudden the evangelist stood up, started praying, walking around. Oh, Lord, blah, 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 blah. And he moved out of the way. I said, thank you, Jesus. You think God ain't real? I walked over there, I walked directly over there, got around to her. I put my hands on her hands and I said, you're not going to move these hands. You're not going to try to hurt anybody. You're not going to do anything until this woman is delivered. 
The next words I said were, up until now you've been dealing with men who don't know who they are in the authority of the Holy Ghost and in the power of Jesus' name. But right now you're dealing with somebody who does. In the name of Jesus, devil come out of her. And I put my hand on her head and she bent over at the waist and vomited up this big old green stringy mucusy looking thing stunk to high heaven all of a sudden you felt the power of God explode in that building all the people who had been praying all of a sudden honey they were shouting and dancing and running the aisles oh my God the Holy Ghost and then she sat back up and I laid my head I said now God fill her with the Holy Ghost and she lifted her hands up and began to speak with other tongues says God give her the utterance for 40 minutes I sat there and watched people who didn't know who to talk to and they weren't getting anything done and God used me there was a reason the Lord had me wait because he needed to show them there's a right way and a wrong way but they weren't going to know their way was wrong until they stood there messing with it for 45 minutes or 40 minutes by then they realized they must not have been doing something right and I didn't mince words I made it plain up until now you've been dealing with men that don't know who they are in the authority of the Holy Ghost I didn't mince words same time I'm rebuking the demon I was rebuking those men that pastor loved me he and I had the best relationship we, we were really tight as all get out for many years it was a wonderful relationship I had with him when God allows us to discern a spirit he expects us to deal with that spirit in Mark 9, 25 through 27, a spirit of infirmity is at work. I want you to notice the Lord does not pray, but he rebukes the spirit. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, Come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. Who did Jesus talk to? Did he pray to the Father? Oh, Father, deliver this boy. Oh, Father, heal this boy. No. He spoke to the demon. You'll notice in this passage, he didn't talk to the sickness. He spoke to the demon because the sickness was caused by a demon. There's a reason why you need to have discernment of spirits. There's a reason why one of the most disgusting, despicable things happening in the Pentecostal church today is that 99% of churches are pastored by pastors who have no discernment of spirits. I'm going to tell you, you've got to be pretty dumb to pastor a church and not beg and plead God to give you discernment of spirits. You know why so many evangelical idiots are running around worshiping Donald Trump? Because they have no discernment of spirits. That's if right. they had discernment of spirits like I've had since I was 12, I used to tell my mother, I said, that person got a spirit. That person got a demon. I could see it just sure as I was alive. I was a kid. And God had already allowed me to see these things. You got preachers praying for the sick in churches. And the person turns around and dies. The person continues to suffer. You don't see miracles. You don't see healings. You don't see things happening like you ought to see. Well, I'll tell you why. Because they're talking to the wrong person. 
If you don't have discernment of spirits, then you're not going to be able to discern when a sickness has a spiritual cause, a spirit of infirmity. When there's a spirit of infirmity, you don't rebuke the sickness. You don't, uh, you know, speak to the sickness. You speak to the spirit of infirmity. You speak to the spirit that is causing that illness or causing that sickness. You follow what I'm saying? We got people running around in the church today. They no more know what discernment of spirits is than they know anything. Here to tell you, when it comes to spiritual warfare, God has given us the authority and the power, and we need to talk to the devil. There are times when I'm praying that I'll interrupt my prayer, you might say. I'll be praying and talking to the Lord, then all of a sudden I'll say, devil, you let go of that person. Let devil, you release your hold on that person. You will spirit of addiction. I said, devil, you, that spirit spirit of addiction. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. If I'm praying for a certain person or I'm praying for somebody and I know their uh, situation or God allows me to discern their situation, all of a sudden I go from talking to the Lord to talking to the enemy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Because you got to know who to talk to. My Lord, have mercy. When it comes to obstacles in our lives, we need to know who to talk to. Don't ask the Lord to remove the obstacle that stands before you. Speak to the obstacle and tell it to move. Hallelujah. Mark 11, 22 and 23. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, unto this mountain, unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Hallelujah. Jesus said, you got an obstacle in your way. You got something trying to tie you up. You got something trying to trip you up. Then you speak to the obstacle and you tell it, get out of my way. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. It's, it's been, Lord, it's been some years back now. Tommy and I were together, but my disability had been suspended because of some kind of a rule that uh, Social Security put into place and it affected my, as well as thousands of other Social Security. And there wasn't a thing in the world I could do about it. I had no income. I was broke. I mean, I was struggling. It was tough. Tommy and I had our own places at that time. We were not living together. I had no rent to pay. had no bills to pay. Things were tough. And one day I'm in my car and I'm praying and I'm saying, Oh Lord, you know, I'm so tired of my finances always being a mess. I'm so tired of my finances always being in such a pickle and things being so hard and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, I guess God finally got through my fat head. You're talking to the wrong guy. You're talking to the wrong person. And I remember it like it was yesterday, booby. I remember... All of a sudden, I said, devil, in the name of Jesus, you let go of my finances. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. You get your hands off of my finances. You're not going to keep troubling me with this foolishness anymore. Woo. Wasn't well, too long after that, Social Security come along, somebody sued them. I didn't, somebody did. But they, they were able to get this rule changed. And all of a sudden, I got three years worth of Social Security sent to me retroactive because for three years I had no income. 
I had three years worth of Social Security sent back to me, all in one lump sum, didn't I? I went, it was around Christmas time, I went to check the balance in my bank account, almost passed out. I had $25,000 in my bank that I had no clue in the universe was going to be there. I remember, I'll never forget it, Tommy and I were sitting on the bed in my apartment, and I sat there and I said, oh, thank you, Jesus, oh, thank you, Jesus, oh, thank you, Jesus. Woo, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Tommy said, what, what, what? I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. He said, what, what? I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. He said, what, what? Finally, I said, there is $25,000 in my bank account. And I don't know what it's doing there. I don't know who sent it. I don't know how it got there. I began to do some research, you know, on the online and looked to try to find out where the money come from and I saw it came from the Social Security Administration. I said, oh my God, have mercy. Tommy and I had been together at that point for eight years. I looked at him, my brother, my brother was going through some hard times and he had actually spent some time in jail and was trying to stay out of jail but he had to pay a certain amount of money by a certain date in order to stay out of jail. The first thought that went to my head, I told Tommy, I said, I'm going to pay for my brother so my brother doesn't have to go back to jail. And I said, and we're going to buy us a house. We're going to move in together. I said, but we're going to buy, we're not going to rent an apartment together. We're going to buy a house. And that's going to be how we bring our two lives together after eight years. And we bought our first house. I was able to make the down payment with that money. Oh, children, I want to tell you, a lot of times we're missing out on the blessings and benefits of God simply because we don't know who to talk to. We're talking to the wrong thing. We're talking to the wrong person. I needed to talk to my obstacle, not to God. God wasn't the problem. Amen. We need to understand today the issue of blessing and cursing. We bless someone when we speak positive words over them. We speak our, uh, of our highest hopes and we speak of the best wishes that we have for their lives. When you say to somebody... I wish you the best. You're blessing them. When you go to a wedding and you say, I hope you have many years of bliss. I hope that you all are, are uh, able to have the best life. You're blessing them. When you speak positive words over someone, you're literally blessing them. I'm going to tell you something, moms and dads. A lot of you don't realize that you lose opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity every day of your life because you do not speak blessing over your children. Oh, but I pray for my children. That's all well and good. But I got news for you. You're not talking to the right source. You need to bless them. You need to bless them. The Word of God said, bless and curse not. You need to bless your children. You need to lay your hand on your baby's head or on your child's arm and say, I hope you have the best day. I hope that God will help you today so that you can learn and it comes easy to you and you can remember what you need to know. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You need to speak positivity over them. Don't tell the Lord what good you want to see in their life. No, God has divined, uh, devised a system whereby we are able to sow into their lives good things. It's called blessing. All people know how to curse. We know how to look at somebody and say, I'll go to hell. How many times do parents look at their children and say, I hope 
you have a child just like you when you get older honey you've just cursed your child you have literally just cursed your child you have spoken negativity into their life and you don't understand that there is power in words. God has caused us to be able to speak blessing. He has caused us to be able to speak a curse. When we say, I hope you grow up and have a child just like you one day, you are in fact cursing your child. When we say, may your every wish and dream come true. May you have a career that you enjoy, a spouse you love madly, and children who are the source of great pride and bring honor to both you and your name. You are blessing. Some people think praying over someone is blessing someone, but blessing is not when we pray over someone. It is when we speak to and over the individual we seek to bless. In the world, they say good luck. That is, in effect, a secular blessing. It says nothing of God, nor uh, does it speak of his involvement in this situation. But it does speak positive word into the situation. Believers ought never say good luck, but rather for the believer we ought to say God bless you. God be with you. God go with you. God speed. Do you follow what I'm saying now? When you say that, you're speaking to the person. You're speaking over the person. You're speaking positive words into their spirit, into their life. You are not talking to God. You're not praying for them. Your blessing in Genesis 28, 1 through 4. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, not to God, unto Jacob. Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Pandanarum, to the house of Bethel, Bethuel, my, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. You see, he spoke a blessing into his son's life. He spoke positive words. Listen, most Christians don't even understand the concept of doing this. We never do this. How often do we do this? Oh, we know how to curse. Matthew 21, 18 through 21. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Speaking of Jesus. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Listen, verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree. What did the Lord just do to the fig tree? He just cursed it. But also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. So the Lord said, not only can you speak to your situation and tell your situation what to do and tell your obstacle what to do. He said, I got news for you, honey. I remember we, I, Tommy recalls, my mother remembers, I bought a Ford station wagon from a 
Uh, no, I don't, I don't want to use that example either. I want to use a different example. I was working at a car dealer. And this car dealership was brand new. They had just spent millions of dollars to install this car dealership. In, and I'm trying to remember where it was. I think it was in Brooklyn or something, if I remember correctly. It's been now, it's been so long, I can barely remember the details. Anyway, these people opened a brand new dealership, and I went to work for them as a salesman because back in the day I used to uh, sell cars for a long time. I sold cars, did very well, made good money at it. And, uh, well, long story short, they did me dirty, and they, they wound up. Uh, making it where I didn't get paid for a whole lot of stuff that I'd sold and done. And uh, I went to the manager and the owner and I said, you folks need to, you need to fuss up. I said, they were doing a lot of their employees wrong, you know. Obviously starting a new dealership is an expensive proposition and everything, but they had spent all kind of millions of dollars to put the dealership in, but apparently they didn't have the money set aside for a lot of other stuff, so they were using the money they were supposed to be paying their employees with to do uh, like advertising and all this. And I went to them, I said, y'all can't be doing this mess. I said this, it don't work like that. I said, we're, if we weren't selling this stuff, you wouldn't have any money coming in to start with, you know, and all this. and. They basically told me, I'll ah, just go find yourself another job. But, you know, they, they didn't even care. And I turned around and I looked at them and I said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. A year from now, you won't even be in business. I said, this dealership will be closed. That's all I said. I didn't think about what I was saying any more than I thought about, you know, what color socks I was going to wear the next day. I just spoke those words to them. I wasn't trying to curse them, I would, you know, but for some reason that came into my head and I spoke those words. And I'll never forget it because they started laughing and they said, oh, we invested millions of dollars to open this dealership. We know how to run a dealership. We're, we're not afraid of, of closing it. Well, long story short, folks, long story short, I kid you not, Within a year, they had a fence around that place. It wasn't a car to be found. It was empty. It was closed. Well, I'll tell you something. I have spoken words like that to a number, haven't I, Tommy? Yep. A number of situations, a number of businesses that tried to do me dirty in business. I told a lady at this one dealership I started telling you about a minute ago, uh, I said, you know what? I said this place is going to be closed in short order. I said you're you're not even going to be still be in business. And she laughed at me and she said, my father built this business from the ground up. We've been at this location for 35 years, and you think you're going to tell me that within a year we're going to be closed? And booby, were they or were they not closed within a year? Yep. I want to tell you the secret of God's people had any brains in their head. They'd understand that God has given you power and authority. And like the prophet in the Old Testament, when you speak a curse, if that curse is applicable and if that curse applies and is legitimate and is just, God is going to cause your word to be honored. The Bible said, that Elisha said there'd be no rain. And it was for that reason that there was no rain. It was not Elijah predicting there'd be no rain. No, 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 no. Elijah spoke it and God made it happen because Elijah spoke it. If God's people would walk in the power and in the authority of the Holy Ghost, you would find that there are things you'd be able to speak positive and negative, I hate to say, into people's lives and into people's experiences. You would understand the power of blessing. And you'd be careful with cursing because the Lord told us not to curse. I didn't curse those people on purpose. I didn't say those words to them with any thought in the world of, because how could I possibly make that happen, you know? But it was like God literally just dropped it in my spirit and I spoke it and by God it happened. Lastly, rebuke. 
Who do we talk to? Who do I talk to? Rebuke is an important function. It often stings and bites, but its lasting effects are positive and constructive. When we fail to rebuke, when the situation calls for a rebuke, we allow something to continue and to grow that we might have cut off had we acted decisively and spoken a word of rebuke. You know, shock value is often the most important element of a rebuke. I'll tell you, when, when, when somebody rebukes you for something you've said or done that wasn't at all right, wasn't even close to being right, a lot of times we're shocked out of our mind because we're not accustomed to anybody calling us on it, you know, and, and pointing it to us that quickly and that bluntly. I've had pastors rebuke me over the years when I was younger over a couple of things and it stung, I didn't much like it, can't say I enjoyed it, but you know what? I remembered it, I remember it to this day. A clear and purposeful rebuke may surprise us, but in that startling moment, we are suddenly brought to the realization that our attitude, our spirit, our motivation, or our intent were not appropriate, our actions. A rebuke is addressed to the person, to the person, not to the spirit. Now you remember when it comes to spiritual warfare, you can rebuke a spirit, all right? But in the case of a rebuke, you don't rebuke a spirit, you're rebuking the person. You're actually rebuking an individual. When a person, not a spirit, is in need of a sharp course change. We speak a word of rebuke to them directly. A rebuke need not contain the word rebuke. Okay, some people think if you rebuke somebody, you go, I rebuke you, you know. No, no, no. It is simply a sharp and concise word of disapproval and chastisement. For example, don't you ever come against my testimony like that. Remember what I told that old man on the phone? Don't you ever come against my testimony like that. Or don't you ever speak ill of another believer. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget when I was pastor in my first church, one of my uncles, my mother's brothers, began to kind of date one of the ladies in the church. And I loved her dearly. But she she had some issues, some some you know personal issues. I want to go into great detail. When you're a pastor, you know you love everybody, but at the same time you're you're aware of things in their life that might create havoc. You know, well the the particular uncle who was trying to date her had his own bag of nuts. I mean, he had his own pile of issues. And you put the two of them together and all you were going to find was an explosion. It was going to be a mess. And one day I was talking to my grandmother and I said, Boy, I sure wish so-and-so wasn't trying to be dating so-and-so. I said, that's just not a good situation. That's not a good mix at all. And my grandmother said, well, yes. She said, I know my son's got all his issues. And, and then she said something about, and that person, you know, she's about half crazy or something like that, you know, and herself and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at my grandmother and I said, Grandma, don't you ever talk about one of my church folk like that. Don't you ever talk about one of my church people like that. I said, I know she's got issues. I know that she's, you know, poor lady. She's been through a lot in her life. And, you know, I know this isn't a good situation. I said, but you know what? But don't, that's, that's, a, that's a, one of the sheep that God's given me to care for. I said, don't you ever speak a negative word about one of my people like that in front of me. And boy, my grandmother was shocked, you know. But guess what? She never did again. You follow what I'm saying? That's a rebuke. You don't have to speak the word rebuke to speak a word of rebuke. 
The word of God says, I'm trying to close. Luke 9, 51 through 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Notice they didn't say, do you want us to pray that fire will come down from heaven? Notice they didn't say, they said, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven? Apparently they had a different understanding of things than we do, didn't they? Mm. But Jesus turned, he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. If you're a Christian and you've got somebody who actually stands there and says, uh, I wish every gay person in this country just dropped dead. I wish we'd start throwing them in jail and putting them in the electric chair. And that person claims to be a child of God and claims to know the Lord. And if you've got the Holy Ghost and if you understand the Word of God, you ought to look at that person and say, Don't you ever talk like that. Those are souls for whom Jesus died. Right. God loves them whether you can or not. That's right. See, that's a rebuke. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? See, people a lot of times are going to keep going down the wrong path until somebody shocks them, until somebody hits them right between the eyes with the word of rebuke. In Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God but the things that be of men. When you look at somebody and you say, get thee behind me, Satan, what he was saying to Peter was, you're acting like the enemy. You're acting like the devil. You're, you're not desiring the things of God. You're desiring what you want rather than what God wants. That is a word of repute. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I'm going to tell you a lot of times... I've had to rebuke folks sometime in the church, and you know what? Instead of them receiving it with humility and accepting it and understanding that I wasn't trying to hurt them, I was trying to help them, they acted like a donkey and went running off crying and weeping and wailing. And was the pastor right? Is what he said right? Yeah, it absolutely was. Was it scriptural? It absolutely was scriptural. Did he say it hatefully or with malice? No, he did not. But they're not going to receive that rebuke so that it can benefit them and it can do them some good. I'm going to tell you, I told you before, I've had pastors over the course of my life that have, not a lot, but I've had uh, one pastor in particular one time spoke a word of rebuke to me. And man, I'm telling you, it hit me right between the eyes. I can actually remember two instances. Brother Carver, I told Tommy the other day about an experience with the pastor I did my internship with. He kind of spoke a word of rebuke to me. And to this day, I've never forgotten what he said. And you know what? I have, it, it changed the way I approach certain things. Same thing with Brother Brock. 
The pastor who baptized me in Jesus' name, he spoke a word of rebuke to me one time about how I, how I uh, did a certain thing. And I wasn't doing it right. I wasn't acting right. And he called me on it. And you know what? I never forgot it. It changed my life. If you have godly humility, then a word of rebuke is not going to set you off. Uh, if you've got pride, it might. But if you have godly humility, it will not. Speaking to the correct individual or object. I might as well stop because I don't want that keep going, so I need to shut up if that wasn't going to shut up. Speaking to the correct individual or object is important in each and every situation. A child of God who understands their position as the offspring of the Almighty and who carries themselves as such will find great benefit and blessing in knowing who or what to address in every situation. We only continue to suffer and perceive that the Lord has not heard us when we pray when we continue to erroneously go to God. When He Himself has given us the tools to resolve the matter ourselves. If the Lord intervened every time in spite of His having equipped and instructed us as to how to go about dealing with certain issues, we would never learn. And as little children, we would never understand how to grow up in Christ and stand for ourselves and do what God has enabled us to do. Amen. Who do I talk to? Knowing who to talk to is important as a child of God. Remember this. Proverbs 18, 20 through 21 as I close. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Who do I talk to? Well, knowing the right place to talk, knowing the right direction to talk in and who to talk to makes all the difference in the world as a child of God, as to whether or not we see things happen, whether or not we walk in victory, whether or not our prayer gets answered, whether or not our obstacle gets moved, whether or not the demon is dislodged, knowing who to talk to is so important. And today, I hope I've helped you to understand who do I talk to. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen. I